Since completion of his PhD degree in zoology and entomology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, he has conducted his research at the University of California, Davis, National Science Foundation, and the University of Washington. Professor O'Donnell's research interests span over evolutionary neurobiology, social behavior, population biology, and community ecology. He conducts tropical field work in Costa Rica and Ecuador, and has appeared in documentary programs on National Geographic Wild and BBC America. Today, he will tell us about the co connection between climate change and the nervous system. So, Professor uh, O'Donnell, if uh, your presentation is ready, then the stage is yours. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so is my, is my screen shared? Can everybody see the presentation? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so um, thank you so much for, for being here and, and uh, listening to my ideas about linking uh, climate change with the nervous system. So I'll open just by making the, uh, hopefully by now at this point in the uh, symposium obvious point that directional climate change or global warming is causing rapid and dramatic alterations of animals' environments. So this is just a map. Uh, so, sorry, a lot of my examples are going to be um, new world based. Um, sorry for the bias there. But, uh, you know, this is a map of the United States showing a uh, comparison of average annual temperatures between recent decades and earlier decades in the beginning of the 20th century. You can see that across almost the entire um, subcontinent, uh, we've seen um, massive indications of warming. So temperatures have gone up dramatically. Um, so the question that I'm interested in addressing is to think about how animals in particular are going to respond to changing climates. So You've probably uh, heard as examples of the kinds of changes we're going to see for animals. Um, things like uh, indicated in this map. Now, this is uh, in, an example for a small uh, passerine perching bird, the Carolina chickadee. Um, this is a combination of data collection and modeling showing how ranges are expected, geographic ranges expected to shift uh, in response to predicted global warming. And so the current range of this species is the orange and gray areas on the map and the projected future geographic range is the gray and uh, bluish areas on the map. So a lot of interest has been uh, dedicated to thinking about things like ecological effects of climate change, including things like rain shifts. I'd like to propose that the nervous system um, both the peripheral nervous system and the brain, and I'll talk about a little bit about what I mean by that, is a really important and overlooked in many ways factor in animal responses to climate change. And my reasoning behind this is that the nervous system is really at the forefront of animals' interactions with their environments. And we can think of this in a couple of different ways. The nervous system, first of all, regulates behavioral responses to temperatures. And so the kinds of patterns that we uh, think about ecologically, like rain shifts, are likely to involve, at least in part, behavioral responses. And the nervous system is going to be involved in making those changes. Um, and also, very importantly, from a more uh, physiological point of view, or a mechanistic point of view, the nervous, nervous system itself is also affected or influenced by changing environments. And these effects can be both direct and indirect. And I'll talk about some possible examples of that. Cognitive scientists, scientists who are interested in the structure and function of the nervous system and its links to behavior, um, somewhat arbitrarily divide the nervous system into two major sections that are related to information processing. So we talk about peripheral systems, the sensory systems that are collecting information from the environment and feeding it into the animal's body, into the nervous system. And here's a, a nice example of this. There are actually some species that have specialized organs like these pit vipers um, that are actually dedicated to detecting temperature variation. And then cognitive scientists think about the nervous system, the other kind of the other major region of the nervous system as comprising the central or integrative cognitive systems, uh, often housed in the brain. And uh, these are important in 
the assessment of the cognitive benefits of responses to temperature variation. Um, I will say that peripheral systems are more accessible from an empirical point of view and uh, in many ways better understood than the central cognitive systems, but the central cognitive systems are probably a very important part of this story. So I just want to use this little diagram here to kind of map out some of the ways that uh, climate change can interface with neurobiology or with the nervous system. So one kind of indirect effect that climate change can have, uh, warming and other changes in the local environment can cause changes in stimuli. For example, you can think of chemical stimuli that are important to an animal uh, being affected by changes in temperature that can change the distribution or the concentrations of chemicals and generate new sensory environments. And in a lot of cases, these are likely to have a negative impact on the animal's fitness. There can also be rather direct effects of extreme temperatures on the nervous system, either on its function or its development. And again, in most cases, these are likely to be negative effects. Uh, over the short term, then, these kinds of impacts on the nervous system can change the costs and benefits of behavioral decisions that animals make in response to their environments. And again, uh, at least on the short term, we expect these to be negative. And by negative, I mean they're likely to have uh, a, a lead to a decrease in fitness, either uh, reproductive success or uh, survival for the animals involved. However, interestingly, there's also the possibility that these kinds of negative impacts on fitness can then drive over a longer term. Uh, the evolution of nervous systems through natural selection. So I'd like to walk through, uh, for those of you who are not animal biologists or not physiologists, um, just a really brief introduction to the ways that animal physiologists think about temperatures effects on animals. And one of the ways that we often model this or study this is to uh, collect data on as a response variable on the y-axis, some measure of performance, either behavioral performance or physiological performance, we might even measure fitness of the animals uh, across a range of temperatures. And oftentimes the data look something like this, and we call this a performance function. So it's basically the relationship between whatever measure of performance uh, we're measuring and temperature. And they often have a shape, a form that's roughly like this. So Performance is bounded at the low end in cool temperatures by a minimal accepted temp acceptable temperature, at the high end by a maximum acceptable temperature, and somewhere in the middle, there's a, either an actual single temperature or use more often a range of temperatures that represent optimum performance. We can look, look at the shapes uh, and locations of these performance curves along a temperature gradient get an understanding of how the animals are going to be responding to or affected by temperature variation. So let's imagine, let me just go back here. So imagine that this is our initial, uh, in the animal's geographic range, this is the initial range of temperatures that it experiences and its performance, physiological performance mapped onto that. If the local environment warms and the temperature changes, then we might expect to see some kind of a shift in that physiological performance curve. And so the question is, uh, how is performance going to change in this new warmed environment? And there are a number of possibilities, and I'd like to explore these possibilities and use nervous system examples, uh, thinking about how changing temperatures can affect the nervous system or interface with the nervous system. So one obvious uh, prediction we might make is that performance will drop, right? In this, norm in this warmed uh, environment, which is no longer physiologically appropriate for the species, we might see a decrease in fitness or performance. And as an example, uh, I think a very interesting one uh, of how this could play out in the nervous system itself, I'd like to offer uh, recent data that have been collected. I think very interesting, exciting studies have been done on monarch butterflies. So these are these beautiful butterflies uh, that perform an absolutely spectacular migration in North America. And the key part of the migration that I'd like to draw your attention to on the map there on the right is this one generation of butterflies that um, late in the summer and early in the fall uh, depart the southern United States 
migrate hundreds of miles down to central Mexico, to mountainous areas outside of Mexico City. They then overwinter there, and then those same individuals uh, in the spring depart and reinvade, if you will, or migrate back to uh, southern North America, southern United States. Um, so the butterflies, uh, the same individuals, are flying south in the fall, overwintering for an extended period, and then flying north again in the spring. It turns out that the monarchs uh, orient, they use a time-corrected sun, com sun compass in their antennae to determine the approximate direction that they're flying in and help guide them towards their overwintering site. The interesting thing about this is that, of course, if they're going to fly south in the fall um, and then north again in the spring, uh, the sun compass has to change its polarity, right? It has to kind of indicate the opposite preferred direction. It turns out that the polarity of the sun compass shifts over the course of the winter and it requires being exposed to cold temperatures. So ganges like day length both seem to have a big effect. Um, temperature is the critical variable here. Potential problem is, of course, that warming at the overwintering site could potentially cause the compass to fail to uh, realign, uh, to shift in direction, and that would indicate the wrong flight direction, which would probably be disastrous for the monarchs. Another possible change that could occur in response to warming is the animals could change their behavior somehow in order to regain the original favorable conditions. So here is our performance curve under the warmed conditions. Um, if the animals can behave in a way that gets them back into more appropriate thermal environments at more appropriate range of temperatures, then we might expect to see perhaps a rebound, a response where their performance function uh, goes back to something closer to its original form. There are a number of ways that animals can do this. So they could move to a new geographic range. That was that original uh, ecological example that I gave with the uh, Carolina chickadees. The animals could shift to using, stay in the same location, but shift to using a new micro habitat that is more thermally favorable. Um, animals could also change the timing of their behavior. So they could either shift the time of day when they're active, or they could shift the seasonality of their activity. And uh, these are all possibilities. They've all been documented in some examples in different kinds of animals. I just want to point out that the, an often uh, overlooked aspect of this is that all of these require neural or nervous system responses, um, whether and to what extent the peripheral nervous system versus the central nervous system uh, are involved in these is not very well understood. Again, we have a better understanding of what's going on in the uh, sensory periphery than we do in the integrative central cognitive systems. If animals are going to shift to a new, you know, one of the possibilities I mentioned um, at the end here, changing their either daytime or seasonal activity period to achieve a more appropriate temperature environment, um, that kind of change is likely to involve, if it's happening over evolutionary time, the evolution of what are sometimes referred to as clock genes. There's a very interesting set of loci, it turns out a, a large number of these now have been identified across different animal systems. Um, these are genes that are expressed cyclically and their expression patterns are associated with the timing of short and longer term behavioral rhythms. In fact, sometimes the same locus is involved, uh, I think, you know, rather surprisingly in both short and longer term uh, rhythmic patterns of behavior. So, they can affect, for example, day-night activity, so approximately uh, over the course of a day. That could affect, of course, your exposure to temperatures uh, as they change over the course of the day. Uh, there, it can also be involved in seasonal patterns. So for example, shifts from summer typical behavior to uh, fall or winter typical behavior. These genes are very exciting uh, because their expression is often localized uh, it's often localized in the nervous system and in fact sometimes in particular brain regions and in some model systems like this Drosophila brain that we see illustrated here, these uh, clock genes are expressed in a very small and easily identified population of specific neurons. So we could actually trace the circuitry of timing in uh, some model systems. And it has been demonstrated that clock gene alleles 
do correspond, so genetic variation at these loci corresponds to differences in periodicity, and the frequencies of these alleles can vary across thermally varying environments. So for example, if we look across latitude, um, we see changes in allele frequency at this one particular uh, uh, clock locus that's being uh, illustrated here. So we might expect to see with changing climates then uh, actual evolution at these loci, and that could conceivably happen over a very short time scale. And then uh, another kind of change that we might see happen is a shift in thermal performance to better match the new environment. And this can happen by physiological processes that are called acclimation over the short term. And again, as we've already been talking about a little bit, there can be longer term evolutionary responses where we're actually seeing changes in uh, allele frequencies in response to uh, thermal selection on the animals. We don't know a lot about the possibility of thermal evolution um, or uh, evolution in response to uh, changing uh, thermal conditions. Um, I want to use an example from another, uh, possibly slightly related, um, but another abiotic factor, which is light levels, just as an illustration of the fact that nervous systems can and do evolve in response to the abiotic or physical environment. And so talking about light levels, when animal species transition over evolutionary time to darker environments, it's a very consistent pattern that investment in brain regions that are dedicated to processing visual input changes. So here's one example. If we look at insectivorous mammals, where we see some evolutionary transitions from originally above ground behavior to underground behavior, and also in this fascinating system, cavefish from Mexico, uh, in this case, the animals uh, have moved from a light environment to a dark environment by moving from surface stream to invading caves. And in both of these cases, vision processing brain regions decrease in the dark living species. And from my own lab, we have, I think, a really interesting complementary example in armiats. In this case, the evolutionary shift was in exactly the opposite direction. So we have evidence to suggest that species moved from being underground active to above ground active. And along with this shift, we see exactly the opposite or complementary change in brain investment. So if we look at the underground species, a visual processing region in the brain, the optic lobes um, represent about 0.002% of total brain volume. And in the derived above ground species, the optic lobe to brain ratio is about um, 0.01. And so this is about a five-fold increase in the relative volume of the optic lobes, which are these red regions uh, in this little reconstruction of a brain shown here. So they're showing a nice complementary pattern to what we saw in the uh, insectivores and the cavefish. So the visual processing brain regions increased in the above ground species. So can the nervous system evolve in response to changing temperature environments? And again, we know less about that process. I think there's good precedent and there's good reason to expect that it is completely plausible. Um, I'm going to argue, uh, moving again back out to the sensory periphery of the nervous system, that good loci to look for are this uh, population of proteins, so-called thermal sensor loci. They're in a family of uh, genes called transient receptor, receptor potential proteins, or TRP loci. Um, this is a really interesting set of genetic loci that are involved in many sensory and other physiological processes. And uh, I think there's a very interesting connection here. Um, these loci are involved both in sensing actual temperature and, and regulating and setting animals' responses to changes in their thermal environments, they are also involved in other sensory modalities, for example, taste. Um, so there's actually a, an interesting match between the ways that these loci map onto tastes and the ways that they map onto temperature. So you can see a connection on the, in this diagram between these different 
uh, thermal sensor loci being tuned to both different temperatures in environments and different, if you will, hotness and coolness of foods. And we seem to perceive these two different aspects of our environments in similar ways. And that seems to be true for uh, other species as well. So there's at least potential for evolution of the ways that animals are sensing their thermal environment and you know, what the appropriate temperatures uh, are and what, uh, how and whether the animal should respond to a particular temperature uh, might be driven in part by evolution at these loci. So my lab is uh, pursuing this question. Um, we're exploring, just beginning to explore TRP evolution using, again, RMES as a model system. Um, the thing that's interesting here is, again, we're taking advantage of the fact that the species differ in their degree of above versus underground activity. And we've just started uh, making inroads towards being able to sequence uh, species differences in these TRP loci that are involved in sensation of temperature. And uh, our idea is that, again, the above ground species are going to be exposed to and less sensitive to high temperatures. And we're going to ask whether that is reflected in uh, variation in the side. So I'd like to thank everybody for listening. Um, and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions uh, if you're interested in following up on this talk, uh, uh, there's th some information from this talk uh, is, is written up in a review paper that I published in uh, Science of Nature uh, back in uh, 2018. So again, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for also for being on time. I would like to remind also uh, attendees that they can still uh, use the Q and A window for asking questions. And okay, we already have the first question. So, in the performance curve uh, which you are showing, it looks like the curve drops much more dramatically when the temperature is above the optimum than when it is below. So this looks very worrying in a climate change perspective. So, is there a common trend across species? Uh, could you say a bit more about this? For example how it can be understood physiological or evolutionary cause? Yeah, wow, that, that's a fantastic <laughs> question. I'm, I'm really, really glad you asked that because, you know, obviously I could have just, you know, that was a kind of an, an idealized imaginary curve that I made, but I definitely tailored it to looking like the patterns that we often see empirically. And it turns out that, yes, in fact, for many physiological functions and oftentimes for biological fitness, when we've actually been able to measure that, um, the, curve, the curves do tend to have exactly that form that you noticed. I thought, you know, that's a really insightful observation. So yes, in fact, oftentimes the optimum is usually relatively close to the maximum tolerable uh, temperature. And oftentimes there is a relatively abrupt drop off at the high end compared to a relatively slow ramp up um, from the low end. And, uh, and I completely agree with you. What that suggests is, you know, the directionality of temperature changes under global climate change usually are in the, obviously, the direction of temperatures increasing. Um, and that does, in mm -hmm. fact, imply the potential for very strong uh, selection, um, lots of mortality and lots of physiological stress and suffering in, in animals at the high end of the temperature range. And so, uh, you know, species capacity to do things like escape that new thermal environment in those ways that I laid out um, become very, very important. And I think the nervous system is a, a, absolutely at the center of us understanding whether and how animals are going to be able to pull that off. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So uh, another question is, um, if only certain animals have the clock genes, so, or uh, do all species have them? So also humans, do you have such clock genes? Oh, yes. Also, excellent question. Uh, it turns out, so if I remember correctly, I believe the first discoveries of so-called clock genes were made in uh, Drosophila melanogaster, a model uh, genetic system in the lab. Um, it turns out that these uh, lo loci in this, that have these properties, and it turns out that there are actually multiple gene families that contribute to rhythmic clock-like behavior. Um, and that's kind of an interesting point. Um, but the initial so-called periodicity loci that were discovered in Drosophila um, turn out to be highly genetically conserved. And so there's actually a high degree of conservation of 
uh, genetic of, of uh, uh, sequence information in Drosophila and humans, and these are very very widespread across animals. You know, perhaps even universal. Um, now, there is, again, some variation in exactly which loci different species use and how they use them, um, but the, the existence and reliance on these uh, loci or loci that have this kind of behavior is uh, very, very widespread and definitely important in humans, for sure. Thank you. Uh, so, another question. Uh, do you think that TRP evolution could be studied experimentally as opposed to comparative approaches? I think it absolutely could be, yes. Yeah, I think that's a very exciting possibility. We're, we're at the point right now, um, you know, what, one of the challenges that we've faced, and you know, of course I'm at a very frustrating point right now because of the, uh, the COVID lockdown, right, is that you know, I'm, I'm working at home, um, my students are all working at home, we're trying to stay as safe as we can, we are not going into the lab. Um, I had uh, a fair amount of money invested in my lab uh, for this quarter and for the summer um, to start collecting data on that system, and of course, we're not getting that done, which is um, which is a little frustrating for me. But you know, we're all dealing with with bad effects of this right situation, right? So um, we had started making some headway towards this. The, the, the TRP loci are interesting; they're difficult to work with because these proteins, uh, uh, the protein products of these genes, are absolutely huge. So they're too big to sequence all the way through by standard sequencing methods. So we've actually had to develop um, three different sets of primers and we're sequencing those genes in three different segments that overlap uh, to try to get the entire sequence. And um, so we haven't really gotten very far into understanding uh, how variable these loci are. We've so far looked within one species with a very small sample size, we have not seen variability but we think it's much more likely if we look across species that we will see variation in the, in the key uh, locus that we're going after. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And there's one more question. Uh, is there some experience about temperature performance diagrams comparing not mean temperature, but variance of temperature to performance? Mm. Yes, also a great question. Um, and, and also an important one, because one thing that we are seeing happening in some locations is not only increases in mean temperature, uh, but also changes in variability of temperature and other uh, climate relevant features at particular locations. Um, so we have some evidence. One of the ways that we're addressing that question, uh, again, using army ants as a model, uh, one of the things that makes army ants really interesting is that they form temporary nests that are, they don't dig a nest or they don't construct a nest like lots of other social insects. They actually kind of assemble the nest by interlocking the bodies, uh, the hundreds of thousands of workers that live in the colony. So it's like a living building. And it turns out that it is imperfectly thermally homeostatic. So they can actually elevate the temperature. Um, they can't maintain it within a very tight window, but it's definitely warmed above ambient conditions. And we've gotten really interested in looking at how temperature variation or the, the amount of temperature variation inside the bivouac when the ants are challenged by different thermal conditions. So cool temperatures, for example, up in the mountains versus warm temperatures down in the lowlands, um, how that uh, variation inside the bivouac might be affecting the development of the offspring in, inside. And uh, th there isn't as much data, there, you know, physiologists haven't collected as much data on temperature variation as they have on means, you know, because it's simply easier to do, right? We go after the low hanging fruit first, I guess you would say. Um, but there is some evidence that temperature variation can also be very important in understanding physiological performance. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Uh, so right now we have no more questions, but uh, thank you once again. Thank you.